kind of like what we were saying earlier going since the beginning of time is that people forget that what is projected is not reality either because we're getting one side or a limited scope of somebody whereas you know everybody is happy everybody's sad everybody gets mad about this or is upset about that you know that's just right that's normal i mean it's like i mean like today uh uh on this day and age with the with some of the younger artists to sit and you'll have the artist sit in front of you with with doing the interview and he got money on the table <laughs> like <laughs> that shit is i'm like all right so what does it have to do with you know soren asking him quite like that has nothing to do with it so why do you have stacks of money on the table like <laughs> what kind of sense does that shit make what everything is prop everything is you know perception everything is i got money or you know i'm living good every single day or it, that's just not logical man that, that's just not life right and i think people especially with celebrities or artists or actors or whatever it is that people forget that they're people too they're not this you saw them in one video you don't know this person that's what they were in that video even if they're representing the real or doing reality rap they also love their wife or their kid or they're you know investing in stocks whatever it is they're not exactly they're not one you know, we're human beings before anything before right. music before writing before drumming before whatever we're human first man right yeah so with that being said uh, on the human level of things between word life and jewels like before word life there was like a three-year window and almost another three-year window before your second album obviously you were doing stuff and putting out different things but what was the process and why did it take three years to come back on the album side um i was actually torn a lot off of that first album like i said um Damn, I wish a lot of this, uh, uh, some of this shit was documented. Like, I toured a lot with Big and Craig Mack on that first album. Another thing people don't know is, you know, um, me and Puff had to sit down about management, but I just didn't do it because he wanted to remix the whole album, and I wasn't with that. Word Life or Jules? Word Life. Hmm. But this was in the mix of, me touring with, I was doing a lot of spots with, with Craig and Biggie. Biggie had Juicy, I think Juicy was gold already, but Craig was was killing it every night. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like he would do three, four shows in one night. Right. So I learned a lot from them uh, doing shows with Craig Mack. Craig Mack would want to go on before me sometimes so he could get to the next town. But after a couple of times with me letting him do that, I'm like, yo, man, like, ain't nobody trying to see me after you do flavor in your ear. <laughs> like, so that's not happening. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, um, and shit, Biggie had Juicy. That was a gold single, but Craig, I, yo, I wish we had this on film. It, 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 he was killing it. And um, I remember being on the road with P.E., you know, uh, uh, during that time so in the midst of those that hiatus as far as not doing another record i was actually in transition of getting off a of wild pitch too right and um nobody had to tell me this but i just started working on the next album i was making money um i felt it was time in my mind i can't give you the exact moment where i was like yo i gotta start working on jewels or this is the name of the album it was just, I got to start working on music because, you know, it's when we're coming up on three years. And um, before I had to deal with Payday, um, I was like a quarter of the way in with the, with the second album. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And nobody had to tell me that. You know what I'm saying? I just knew I had to uh, 
come up with some new stuff. And I knew the sound that I did on the first record was over. I had to move on. I had to, I'm, I'm watching what's going on, life going so fast. And, you know, what was I going to come up with with the sophomore record? And, you know, I started working. I started working with B minus. Um, I think first on the album. Okay. And um, my first idea was with um, Mr. Wolf. And I brought him the dangerous joint, and he cursed me out. What? Word. Was it like, I'm not doing that law? shit. Was it down by law? Or? Well, the, the, the ninth one is, is Seventh Wonder. That's the name of the record. The original, the original record. Right, right. And um, of course, I, I was in, I love the Shan record. I owe, that's a Park Jam record. Right. But um, I don't know. I was just feeling that vibe. And, Yo, Walt cursed me out. Ask him. He was like, I'm not doing that shit. Like, ain't no dick. Like, don't, everybody, the crew, everybody. I brought the record to everybody in the crew. They, uh, DITC producers, they was like, nah. Like, that's too easy. Like, you trying to get, and it was just like, I'm not doing it because I'm trying to go for radio. It's a, a hip hop record. You know what I'm saying? And of course, I wrote, I, I wrote Walt a, a check and, Change his mind? <laughs> Change his mind. He still was like, I still don't like the record at first. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, there was other things we'll get to going back in a second, but since we're on mm -hmm. Dangerous, what, what made Big L like it if everybody was dissing it? Well, that's the thing. L didn't know about the idea until when I heard that, when I, when I thought about it, I was like, I thought about L. Okay. And, um... I thought about some back and forth shit with L. And um, I think uh, I spoke to him. I gave him the idea. He was like, you know, easy peasy. Like, all right, when you want to go in. And, you know, he, he came in and we, we did the record like one day. Okay. <clears throat> Something like that. But L had book around. So, it was just like finding the right combination and the tempo and stuff like that. And I think the last two, uh, the last part of the record we wrote back to back, but you know, most of that stuff he had already. Okay. All right, so going back, I did want to ask you, cause I saw um, in Maryland, there was a club called Hammerjacks in Baltimore. And I saw, mm -hmm. I saw Biggie, Mob Deep, and world renowned there. Mm -hmm. And that was a, you know, that was one of the main show uh, clubs for rap at the time in Baltimore, but it also was mm -hmm. super small. So super small. I remember that spot. Yeah, that was my favorite place in Baltimore to go, man. I love Hammerjacks. I saw so many great shows there. But <clears throat> my question is, as somebody that was doing your own touring and then going with people that did have gold records and that were on their way up, what difference did you see performing in and seeing the smaller clubs at, and then as your career and as others grew to where it started going to the small uh, arena type of things and bigger and bigger, like what difference did you see of how things worked on the, on the performance side, on the creative side, on the business side? Um. I mean, being on the Chitlin circuit, we call that the Chitlin circuit, doing the small clubs and stuff like that, which I have no problem doing. Right. I think um, staying in touch with the people gives you longevity. I think you teeter with being obsolete or not being, you know, a bigger artist, depending on what kind of team you have around you. And for me, um, yo, it's weird, man. I could do arenas with DITC and I can do clubs by myself. DITC, we stand in front of 50 to 60,000 people. We've done festivals for years, you know what I'm saying? And, and 
doing the club thing, um, that shit just kept me around. It kept me around to this day. Right. And a lot of people wasn't going overseas either back then. You know, I, like I said, I ain't getting into no names and stuff like that, but a lot of people, a lot of my peers would snub their nose at that shit. And um, gold artists that were gold in the States that would come out to Europe, couldn't, they couldn't do the, 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 the radio shit at the spots we was doing. And we was doing big spots. And they would be like, damn, like they would look confused sometimes. Like, I sold gold, like you only sold 100,000 records. Like, how is that? Like, how is this possible? And it's like, yo, you can't come in and do one verse. You have to do a show. You have to do songs. You have to put a show on. And um, I think, being in the little clubs teaches you that shit is gladiator school, put it like that. Okay. It's gladiator school. And Biggie went through it. Craig Mack went through it. A lot of people went through it. You know what I'm saying? But who stood the test of time is the key at the end of the day. Right. And I think um, yo, I'm 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 glad. I mean, of course, every artist wants to sell a million records, man, but I think it worked in my favor me still being around 20 plus years later, not selling all these records. Cause a lot of people sell records and they're not around today. Yeah, and that's why I said at the beginning, man, it's important that people that know you or don't know you, that the myth of people not putting out music and you've been putting it out since you started coming out. And that, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> whether that's trophies or that's ozone files, you know, granted, that's more older stuff, but it's like the quality is still there if you're into actually listening to the music. So right. the challenge is like a, a like with the trophies, for instance, which came out now. Wow. I mean, it's almost like 10 years ago at this point. But what did you find? Because uh, I remember that album getting a lot of acclaim and a lot of people loved it. So when. Trophies? When, yeah. At least the people I knew. Did you mm -hmm. find that or no? What about it though? Uh, no, I, I, a lot of people I knew liked it, and they were glad right. to see, glad to see you were still out there. I think Apollo Brown doesn't get a lot of recognition as a producer, but I think he brings uh, a great sound, and I think you guys work well together. Mm -hmm. um, and I also thought it was cool, even though I love DITC. It was cool to hear you more outside of that comfort zone per se right but to your point of the clubs and the being around i think that enabled you to have a trophies album way down the line right. because you had touched all those different places in the united states and elsewhere right well something like trophies is nostalgic for people the sound um I think I seen a, a interview with Apollo. I'm not saying he's wrong, but he just took he had his take on it, mm -hmm. and we didn't do the album. And he said we did the album in three days. We did the album in like ten hours. <laughs> okay. That's I did the album as soon as I landed. I I knocked the album out the same day. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And people um, don't understand this. I'm not the only one from from. The cloth I'm cut from from my era, Black Moon, Smith and Wesson, AG, anybody you can name from that era has done albums this way, and it's normalcy for us. So, you know, me and Paolo had a bet. He 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 was like, "Yo, I told him I probably get ten or twelve songs done tonight." He looked at me crazy, and I was like. You know, I didn't take this money at the end of the night, but it was just like, yo, this is normal for us, man. Like, we used to go to the, we used to record albums, go to the club, come back, tweak the album, mix it, master it in, in a couple of days and move on to the next. Like, this is what we did. We took the shibbies. Like, right. you know, as opposed to what, you know, you see 
uh, today, and we was doing this on real to reels. This is not no Pro Tools. Yeah, not digital. <laughs> not digital. Right. Period. So, um, but I appreciate what people felt about uh, trophies. You know what I'm saying? But I did trophies. I did an album with 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 a cat in Australia called Debonair P. Uh, I did Opium with PF Cutting. I did Same Moon, Same Sun. I did New Dawn, um, the DITC Studios album. I did a lot of stuff, man. Like people, this is not a um, what do you call it? This is this is not a a. Uh, uh, for me, it's not about uh, popularity. This is my my life. This is I love music. You know, my cat, my 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 um catalog is gonna speak for itself, and I know for a fact. When I'm dead and gone, people are going to discover this shit more. And I'm cool with that. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gang bang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.